Good afternoon, this is Quintus Curtius. This podcast is going to be embedded in an announcement that I'm making on my blog about a new book that I'll be publishing in the summer of 2017, and this book is going to be a translation of the Roman historian Sallust. And the translation will be of his two famous historical works, The Conspiracy of Catiline and The War of Jugurtha, or if we want to give it its correct pronunciation, The War of Jugurtha. So what I'm going to do in this podcast, which won't be very long, is talk about the book a little bit, talk about why I think it's important, why I think readers will enjoy it, and what they can expect to find in my edition of Sallust. Well, the first thing is this translation is something I've been working on for a long time, probably upwards of about two years now. Uh, Sallust has always been a favorite writer of mine, a favorite historian of mine. And I was very attracted to his works simply because they're exciting stories. These are pulse-pounding stories. The first one, The Conspiracy of Catiline, tells the story of a renegade senator who tries to seize power in Rome. Uh, uh, Basically, uh, an attempted coup d'etat. And the second story is about a... uh, an ambitious Numidian king named Jugurtha who waged an insurgent war against Rome and lost. But it's a very, very gripping account. I mean, these are stories that have everything. Uh, internal drama, great characters, great action, uh, vivid descriptions of military events, all sorts of plot twists. And they're just great stories. What I'm going to do now is read the text that's going to appear on the back cover of the book to give you a little bit of an idea about what's in it. Intrigue, murder, the lust for power, and the fatal hubris that leads men to their dooms. These are some of the compelling themes of Sallust's famous works, The Conspiracy of Catiline and The War of Jugurtha. Considered the first of the great Roman historians, Sallust's gripping narratives have been read for centuries for their penetrating character studies, timeless moral insights, and matchless rhetoric. His profiles of flawed men, led inexorably to ruin by excessive ambition or character defects, resonate with us today more powerfully than ever. Deeply concerned with the moral decay and corruption he saw around him, Sallust's pragmatic views of historical forces, personalities, and the psychology of power were aided by his own direct participation in the highest levels of Roman politics. The Conspiracy of Catiline tells the dramatic story of renegade senator Lucius Catiline's attempt to seize power in Rome during the waning days of the Republic. The War of Jugurtha recounts the rise and ultimate destruction of the headstrong Numidian king Jugurtha, who waged an insurgent war against Rome from 112 to 106 BC. And as the fates of men play themselves out on the stage of history, strength of character and the will of fortune will be the ultimate arbiters of human destiny. This completely new translation of Sallust uses a fresh, modern English idiom that preserves the flavor of the historian's renowned epigrammatic style. Fully outfitted for comprehension and efficient referencing, this edition contains footnotes, illustrations, topical organization tables, and a complete subject and name index. Quintus Curtius can be found at qcurtius.com. So this is the text that will appear on the back cover, and that gives you a little bit of an overview of what to expect. And, you know, I've already said that these are great stories, and, you know, I want you to be just as enthusiastic and just as passionate about this material as I am, because I think it's so timely, it's so relevant, it's so important, and yet, in many ways, so neglected, so underappreciated. 
And I've talked about this before, but you know, there was a time when works like Sallust were part of the standard curriculum for Western men. And I really found this out to, in, a, in a very shocking way, you know, as I was doing my research in years past. You know, Latin editions of Sallust were very common in the 19th century. You could find many what they called school editions, Latin editions of uh, the classic, where students would read them, comment on them, learn from them, learn the great character lessons, the great lessons of morality, the great lessons of conduct, of rhetoric, of leadership, of everything. And yet, once the 20th century rolled around, and, and especially after the end of the Second World War, all of that changed. The classical curriculum was gradually replaced, wrongly, I believe, wrongly, by other studies that were held to be more important, more relevant. And, you know, we've paid a very, very high price for all this. We've paid a very high price. And if you know me and if you followed me, you'll know that this is one of my consuming passions, to try to restore these works and this humanistic thinking, really, uh, to the consciousness of the modern man. And I think we've gone a great ways in doing that. You know my translation of Cicero, um, of his On Duties, and before that, Stoic Paradoxes, which I think really helped introduce these great works to a whole audience of men who and women who maybe had never known about them before or known very little about them. Or if they had known something, they were turned off by them because they were difficult to read or they were, they were made difficult to read by inept translations. But no more. It is high time to put these books back in the hands of those who they belong to, which is modern youth, which is us. And I've crafted everything towards that goal. If you notice the cover design I chose, I specifically chose a cover design that reflected modernity. One of the pet peeves that I have is that too many of the covers that you find for the classical works are boring. They're boring, they're stodgy, they're old-fashioned. What you'll have is you'll have some picture of a vase on the cover, you'll have some sort of picture of a fresco or, or some meaningless cover that really doesn't gra grab the attention or arrest the mind of the viewer. No more. My good friend James C. Heffer, one of the geniuses, I think, of the modern art scene, who essentially invented the mass surrealist art movement, provided a cover design that for me really captures the themes of Sallust. You have the, you have a, an, an image of force in the foreground. You've got shadows casting long lines across the the uh, the viewer's image and you've got darkening ominous clouds in the background all set against an industrial gothic scene that combines modernity with traditional themes the sword representing tradition and the industrial gothic the the surrealist imagery combining both modern and ancient and that's just the start when you get inside the work, I've done everything possible to make this a complete edition so that someone who has no experience, no knowledge of this work, of the classics or of Sallust in particular, can pick it up and learn from it immediately. It is fully annotated with hundreds of descriptive footnotes. We have maps. We have illustrations. We have topical organization tables. We've got a detailed table of contents. We have a detailed introduction, and we have a complete descriptive uh, index, including both names and terms. So everything is here. This is a complete self-contained course in and of itself, all designed to take someone with no experience and no knowledge up to a level of understanding and enjoyment. And it's going to be at an inexpensive price. That's my goal. So why should you read this book? Well, I've already talked about the fact that the stories are captivating and exciting. And who cannot be excited by a good story? Who can fail to be influenced or moved by an exciting story? Well, the other reason is these works, or this work in particular, is filled with great language, soaring 
language. Sallust had a very, very particular style. He was influenced by Thucydides. His style in Latin is very epigrammatic. It's very terse, masculine, dense, sometimes to a fault. But it's a very, very distinct style. It's very different from Cicero's. It's very different from Julius Caesar's style. In fact, Sallust is unique in, in many ways. He stands alone. Uh, and I'll, I'm not going to get too much into talking about his style because I'm going to do that in the introduction to the work. And I don't want to bog down things here with too much of a discussion about that. But it is a captivating style. And it's been a real challenge for me to try to render that distinct style in English. But I think I've done it, and I've tried to do it in a modern idiom. In a modern idiom. And there was a real need for a new translation of Sallust because I think, again, just like with Cicero, many of the translations use archaic, old-fashioned terminology. And not only this, this is another thing that I found out, and that I think what my special contribution to the, uh, to the, to the field is, I found that many of the, in fact, all, not many, but all of the translators are, are people who lacked a military background or a legal background, and they just are unable to convey some of the nuances in the descriptions of the military battles, in the nuances of the the relations between the commanding officers and the subordinates, in, in some of the... Uh, some of the the military terms, uh, they just do not really able to tease out all the nuances that I think that Sallust was trying to convey. And I think with my combination of, of having been uh, uh, a military man at one point in my life, familiar with military operations, uh, I think that brings something to the translation that I think others really lack in many ways. It really adds something, as well as the fact that these the, the, Sallust was a trained uh, rhetorician, a trained master of rhetoric. And I think that a lot of the translators just seem to focus more on academic stodginess and, and not on really the verve and the deliverability and the passionate quality of the speeches found in these works. So that's the second reason. Exciting stories is the first, great language. I mean, there are speeches in Sallust that are like nothing that anyone has ever written before. Speeches of just extreme power and persuasiveness. And anyone that's interested in, in public speaking or learning how to make an argument is going to really benefit from studying these speeches. And finally, the reason why it's so, and the most important reason why I think you should read this book is because the great moral lessons that are contained, the great lessons about character, virtue, adversity, struggle, leadership, all the things that I've been talking about for years are all found here in this book, played out on the stage of real life. I mean, these are tragedies of Shakespearean proportions. These are great, great works. And it's all done in such a way that it's it's framed against this backdrop of, of the necessity of virtue, of moral... Uh, excellence and what can happen to a man or to a woman if they allow themselves to be consumed by by evil or by reckless ambition or by putting fortune to the test too much. And I'll close here by reading just a little bit of my translation just to give you an idea about what I'm talking about. What I'm going to do here is read the opening, the opening section, opening first two sections from the War of Jugurtha. In vain does man lament his nature over the fact that it is fragile and transitory and more governed by chance than by virtue. Deeper inquiry shows us, however, that you will find nothing greater or more surpassing and that the world more often lacks human effort than it has its own power or opportunity. But the mind is the leader and commander of the life of mortals. He who marches to glory by the path of virtue has an abundance of strength, power, and renown. Neither does he need fortune, since fortune can neither grant nor revoke from anyone honesty, industry, or any of the other noble qualities. The man consumed by perverse appetites surrenders himself to inertia and the basest cravings of the body. For a short time he enjoys his destructive lusts, 
where strength, opportunity, and good character are drained away through self-indulgence. Blame is fastened on the infirmity of human nature, and the engineers of the crime transfer responsibility to some external factor. But if men had the same care for doing good works as they have enthusiasm for chasing what is of no advantage to them, in many cases even dangerous and harmful to them, they would more often rule fortune than be ruled by it, and would advance to such greatness that, through their glory, they would become immortal among men. For as the human race is composed of both its physical form and a soul, all of our earthly pursuits attend to the nature either of the body or of the soul. Thus a beautiful body, great riches, physical strength, and all other attributes of this type melt away in a short time. But surpassing deeds of character are, like the soul, eternal. That's just the first the first section and the first sentence first two sentences of the uh, second section of the opening of the War of Jugurtha. And you know, who can fail to feel a shiver run down their spine when they hear those fantastic words, that beautiful language, the soaring rhetoric, the invocation to greatness? For me, it does. For me, it does it every time. And maybe that's just me. But I have to think that there are others out there who feel just as inspired, just as passionate, and just as enthusiastic about these great works as I do. So this summer, I will present to you my annotated solace, and I hope you enjoy it. And I will be providing additional updates as we get closer and closer to the launch date. Until that time, I'm Quintus Curtius. Good night.